All right. Um, so uh, we're here to talk about building a solid foundation in Unity. So um, it's kind of just my the sum of my experience in building a lot of mobile games. Um, and I'm trying to kind of give you guys a leg up on starting how to create the best foundation for your code and hopefully reuse it. So I know there was a big party last night. I know you're probably all hungover. And thank you for being here. I know it's the first session in the morning, but just stick with me. We've got a lot of stuff to cover. Uh, there will be questions at the end, and I will be sticking around for questions afterwards as well. So I am an African. I'm from South Africa. Um, I um, am the lead developer of a company called Collective Mass, which is just really me. Um, I'm working with Amorse Inc. to develop Notespace, which is an interactive music uh, book game for girls. Uh, it's really interesting, lots of cool content. Um, then I've also worked in many different industries. So the foundational knowledge that I have here is not just, uh, doesn't just come from games, but it's kind of uh, from the sum of my knowledge of programming in different fields. Um, I've also, uh, most of the games and stuff that I do is quick turnaround. So uh, foundation is really important because um, you can't spend the time at the end fixing problems that you should have done in the beginning that has affected your entire code base. Um, spent a lot of time in Unity. I'm five years dedicated. I love the stuff. Um, it's probably the best game platform I've ever worked with. So awesome Unity. And I cannot spell to save my life. So please don't uh, be upset if there's a spelling mistake somewhere in my presentation. Um, so first of all, I want to get a sense for the skill level for everybody here. Um, how many are, of you guys are new to making games? OK, that's good. Um, how many of you come from the Flash background? Uh, good to see you guys moving on. Um, <laughs> how many of you guys have come from the Unreal background? OK, that's good as well. Um, and how many of you guys have built your own game engines? Oh, look at you. Clever bunch. Right, well, um, a lot of this knowledge just has come out of building my own game engine and then you kind of spend the time doing the stuff and figure out what you think is the best way to do things and see how other people have done them. Um, you definitely, when you build your own engine, you kind of uh, realize why other people have done stuff and I'm really happy to say that Unity has pretty much done everything that I thought uh, was a good idea. Not that I'm great, but Unity is awesome. Um, so what are we doing here? We're trying to ensure that the decisions that we make in the beginning of our project um, are good decisions so that when we get to the end, we don't have to kind of throw our hands up in the air and try and retrofit things. Um, we're also trying to create a robust framework. So Unity is the closest that I've gotten to actually good reusable code. Uh, it sounds silly, but the way that they've done it with their component architecture uh, really makes it easy to be able to put things aside and reuse scripts. So we want to create a robust framework that gets us up and running on new projects really fast, um, and that it's also iterable. So every time you make a new game, you improve your framework and you take that knowledge to the next, uh, next game. So also to give confidence to the new guys. Um, when you get into Unity, like you can make some stuff really fast, but now you need to kind of take that prototype and get it out the door and make money. So this is just to help you guys know that uh, like this is the way I've done things. This is kind of rock solid. Um, try and follow these principles, change it, and do whatever you need to do that suits your needs. Um, but if you start off in this direction, it's probably a good course. Um, prototyping platform, as I said, what we want to do lots of times is kind of spit out a whole bunch of prototypes. But then we would actually like to take that prototype code and um, kind of turn it into a game instead of rewriting it. So having a solid framework helps you get up and running fast, get your prototype up, but then you can also then just take your prototype and carry on making it into a production project. Product. Uh, and this is just the best way that I've found. I've worked on a lot of mobile titles. Uh, I spent a lot of time refining this stuff, but it's just my way. So you guys, I'm sure, have got a whole bunch of different ways of doing things. Uh, I just ask you to consider these ways. Maybe some are helpful, maybe some are not. If you've got a better way of doing things, please tell me so I can get better. Right, so in every presentation they have the big headings. I'm sorry mine don't rhyme or have the same beginning word letter thing, but um, it does, I'm trying to break it up into to brain soakable chunks. So um, first thing is how you use Unity with a team. 
Um, a lot of, you get a lot of issues with people like kind of wasting time committing over other people's projects. And so this is uh, some general rules of thumbs of how to do that. Uh, sanity, to ensure that the stuff that you built and ran on your machine will run on other people's machine um, and that you can be confident that when you get to the production level that it's gonna be exactly the same. Fidelity, make sure that your stuff looks good uh, with mobile platforms and all multiple resolutions and memory and all that kind of stuff. You run into this issue quite a bit. Um, and then platforms, trying to make sure that when you publish your product, like you can easily move from platform to platform. Unity gives us this ability to publish to multiple platforms. It should be really easy. So make your design considerations in the beginning uh, so that when you actually get to switch, it's not you know, a month's worth of time, it's just a couple of days. So base problems that we will address, source control, dividing up work, um, structuring your assets, so like how, you know, what's the best way to make your game objects with animations, et cetera. Um, multiple platforms and integrity, so when you set up your sprites, making sure that you're breaking up into multiple resolutions and how to switch between that stuff. Um, so multi-resolution rendering along with that. Um, and then referencing objects in a scene. It sounds silly, but um, it's one of the biggest problems is having people have a standard way of being able to act, interact with all the game objects underneath. Uh, a lot of people start out using the find function, which is really costly on performance. Um, and it's also not a, like a standard way because it's finding based on name. So this is kind of a, a, a general rule of thumb of how you get to kind of reference things and have things accessible. And then finding your main. For all the Unreal programmers or people who've made your own engine, you know that Unity, you kind of like, well, where's the entry point? Where's the stuff, the start point where I control everything from? And it's really frustrating in the beginning because you're like, I've got this prototype, but you know, sometimes this loads up first. How do I do this? So team, source control. How many guys have had bad things happen with source control in Unity so far? <laughs> Jeez, that's more than, yeah, OK. Um, it's a general problem, so if you're new to Unity, expect this. And um, these are kind of the solutions that, that, that I've come across that help you do this. First, make sure at the very beginning that you um, make your meta files are set as text that allows your um, source control system to be able to compare them. Um, it also allows easy way for you to commit that stuff. Um, use layout scenes and prefabs. So what commonly, uh, the common problem is that people will work on the same scene, commit it at the same time, and stomp everybody else's changes. So there are multiple ways to get around this, um, and one of the best ways is to use prefabs. So um, everybody has their own prefab that they work with, and you have a layout scene which does never gets run in the game, um, but can invoke uh, the main game kind of system to start up, and then you can see your prefab working. So you work in your own scene, with your own prefab, nobody else gets to stomp it. Uh, another good rule of thumb is that because you're breaking these things up into multiple scenes uh, with, your, um, with your game object and your prefab that you can commit yourself, um, you have a social interaction with your group and say, look, this is my scene, I own it. If you want to edit, edit this at all, then you, know, you have to come talk to me first. Sounds simple, but these little things really help. Um, so we will talk about how to, how to best do multi-scene loading, which is the best approach that I have found to get everybody working on separate scenes and putting it together and also reusing scene content. Um, but as far as source control goes, um, I've used a bunch. I know people have had some success with um, Proforce, uh, but my personal favorite is Git. Um, I've had way less issues with Git than SVN. Um, the great thing about it is local committing. So like if you have Git, you have a local repository as well as a remote repository. You get to pull down the latest changes, uh, check how the stuff works with your stuff before you push it up and break anything. Uh, the other great thing is cherry picking commits. So if a week later you found that somebody screwed up, um, you can go back down the Git chain, find the, the broken commit, pull it out of the stack, and the rest just collapse down on top of that. So uh, that's very useful. It's also fast on updates. If you guys are using Mac, uh, I really like the Tower tool. I mean, if you're not used to come online stuff, which maybe everyone is, uh, Tower is a great tool to use. If you're using GitHub, the uh, GitHub tool is all right, but you, I'm gonna have to encourage you guys, if you use Git, to get into the console stuff. It does help you out down the line. Uh, am I moving too fast? Is everybody soaking some stuff in? Awesome. <laughs> Uh, right, so sanity, startup and multi-platform. 
So as I said before, what we're going to do is ensure that we have a single startup object. And I'm going to refer to this as your global. So you're going to have this global object that we're going to ensure is always the first thing loaded and helps you to hang all of your other kind of um, methods or game objects that you need to ensure start up and the order in which they do start up. Um, so that global is ever present um, and it has that order loading thing. Then multi-platform, we're gonna address input. So um, we kind of want to decouple UI from input. We want to allow you to control your own input. Um, it's kind of, it gives you a lot more control. If you're new, it might be a bit daunting to work with, but do consider it. Um, platform identification, knowing if you're on iOS, what iOS device you have, what the resolution of that device is, and how you adjust accordingly. Um, and then encapsulation. So um, Unity is a comp component-based model, and if we're gonna do good uh, component-based component code that is reusable, we need this thing called encapsulation that allows everything inside the module to be able to work um, when you drag and drop it into other parts. So, my framework that I work with, um, I call it the Collective Mass Framework because my company is called Collective Mass and I think it's awesome. Um, we have these specific modules. And uh, so we have a global module, an input manager module, an event manager module, a scene management module, dialogue management module, audio manager, um, quality manager, a build system, and editor tools. So, if you make your own framework, take a look at addressing each one of these issues uh, because it's kind of like the sum knowledge of all the, the uh, problems I've had in Unity and how to make your kind of life a lot easier and your product work solid. So, talking about globals. It's a single omnipresent object, a single entry point, and it's basically a um, mono behavior. You can't get away with not having a mono behavior, there are some ways, but it's best to have one because then you get access to the update loop. Um, it will be on a prefab that gets stored in your global, I mean, in your resources folder so that you can ensure when you build your scene system that you can load it up if it's not there. Um, and it will launch a list of other globals. So you have an array list where you drag in all your other things you want to start up. And then when global starts up, you can ensure that you load them in order. And with the global system, you're gonna have something called a global reference, which will be a static class uh, in which you, when each of those objects load up, it can say, hey, I'm alive. And then anywhere in your project, you can go and reference that guy. Um, make sure that there's this don't destroy on load on your global object. That's a great way that when you switch scenes, it doesn't get destroyed. Um, singletons. So, Singletons have been an approach of how people uh, get to talk to stuff in their code. Um, it has been, I mean, like it's the next solution that you move on to after find. Um, there are a lot of issues with it because they're static objects and they will hold on to references of objects and therefore like, can give you memory leaks and a lot of debugging issues. So when we make singletons uh, using this particular methodology, what we want to try and do is uh, reduce the amount that we have. So we have two or three at any given time. They're things that we kind of know where they are and in every single tin, you have like an init command and a destroy command. So we're gonna break up uh, working with scene, well, with the framework into two basic categories, global, which I'm talking about now, and scene. Um, this allows you to logically separate stuff, but it also knows where like when the scene unloads, your scene reference object then we'll destroy all the um, references to that singleton, and that's really important. Um, so we want to separate your framework from your actual project. So just somewhere in your project, don't put it with your same scripts folder, make a separate folder called framework or my awesome thing, and then put your scripts in there. That allows you to logically in your brain separate it. Everyone in your team understands that when I work on a script, I make a generic script, uh, and then it can graduate to your framework folder if it is completely kind of agnostic of all the other systems. Um, it also allows you to store it in a, se a separate repo so that you can check that out for other projects. Um, but it's also good just for people to understand that this part is, is the stuff that we polish and use for the next project and the next project. Uh, what else I got there? Right, I talked a little bit about scope, global versus scene scope. Um, this is also good for logical separation where you can understand like, hey, these things are ever present. 
These things will always be using X amount of memory. The scene stuff, however, is not ever present and will be destroyed and loading more stuff be destroyed. All right. So it's great talking about global launching objects, but how do you actually do that? And it starts with scenes. So Unity's way of doing stuff is you have a scene is your entry point. That's where everything's gonna launch from and that's where we have to start. So with scene management, we have to, uh, there's a couple of different loading strategies that people have used. Um, one is just the regular way where you move from scene to scene, right? And you destroy everything and load up a whole bunch of new stuff destroy that stuff, load up new stuff. Um, and that's impractical when you want to store references or just keep things around like UI that is permanently around. Um, so then people will adapt to another loading strategy, which is having a single boot scene in which you load lots of prefabs. Um, it's good, there's a couple of problems with that. One is that it's very code driven. So scenes are great things where you can lay out stuff and like set properties and it's great for your artists because they can load stuff and you know, lay it out nicely. Um, and we kind of like inhibit that process a bit by, um, by loading everything in. The other thing is a lot of, uh, some of the, the Unity components such as light mapping and terrain and nav mesh stuff is all based on a scene, right? So, um, you know, if you load your main menu or you have a boot scene, then you have to make sure that those particular components are there already or hidden. Um, and if you're gonna switch from terrain to terrain, you have to switch from scene to scene. Um, so it's not the ideal thing. So now we're gonna come up with um, a way to kind of put those two things together. So as I said, we're having a, a global um, game object that we load up in the beginning, but to ensure that we have a multi-scene loading strategy. So we have this parent scene, right? Um, and in that parent scene, it will then have references to subscenes. And there's a wonderful thing in Unity Pro, which I hope you guys are all using, called uh, Additive Load. And that allows you to additively load scenes into your, um, to your main scene. Um, so we make use of this strategy in having a parent scene, knowing what its subscenes are, and also those subscenes, knowing what its parent scene is. Um, this, this allows us to then add other things into our loading system, right? So if we're loading subscenes from the, this main scene, we can also load in uh, resource bundles. Um, and if you get to that point where your assets are too big, uh, it's not a big deal. You can now just take some of the stuff from a scene and put it into a resource bundle and load it up with the scene. Um, so uh, you can also do that, the same strategy with resources. If you want to like compile or link to separate resources per platform, um, it's a great place to do that. So, yes. So we are talking about subscenes. Um, so this is the general flow. Um, you've got your subscene loads. So. Let me take a step back and talk about how we do subscenes. We'll have UI subscenes, we'll have main game subscenes. Um, and so the whole idea is we have a scene, which is your traditional Unity scene. We can lay out stuff in that that has a specific purpose. So, for instance, if I have a game um, and I have lots of different levels, each one of my levels can be a different scene, but my UI is the same throughout. So I can either load a prefab or I can load a um, uh, have it laid out in the scene already and then have that loaded in. So we choose to do the subscene loading uh, so that you can load in your, AI, your UI. You can also kind of persist that through loading through different levels. So you don't have to reload all your UI all the time. Um, another small thing that is great with loading subscenes with additive load is you get the loading bar. So if anybody has just loaded a straight up scene, you know that we don't get a loading bar, you don't get access to the progress of the loading of the scene. Uh, but with additive load, you can actually just check, you know, what is the process, the progress of my scene loading. So this is the flow. You've got a sub scene that your designer is working in. It's linked up. It knows which its parent scene is. And so sub scene loads, checks, hey, is the global loaded? And says, no, it's not. Then it destroys everything and loads its parent scene because it knows what its parent scene is. The parent scene will do the same thing where it checks, hey, is my global loaded? Yes, no, if it has not loaded, then it doesn't load anything else. Loads up the global and says, okay, great. Everything that, that uh, is supposed to have started up, like my data manager and input stuff is all there. Now I can continue uh, and I don't have to worry about like making null references to things that aren't there. So now that that's all loaded up, then we can go and load up the bundles first. 
so that our, so the scripts and our scenes can access the bundles. After loading up the bundles, we start loading up subscenes and resources. Um, and I found that has been pretty robust. You can also then have um, kind of a loading bar that spans all your assets, being scenes, being resources, and being um, bundles. Right, so these are my general subscenes that I have. I'll have dialogues, UI, um, and game. They're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, Dialogues are like message boxes that pop up over everything, and it's a very useful module that you'll be looking at later. UI is obviously UI, and a game is your game, which is the thing that changes the most, right? So you can have these things that you've already designed that is consistent across um, your entire game, which is your UI, or even just a section of your game, uh, your dialogues. Uh, generally, I will break up these scenes via camera, and you break them up via camera because you render um, uh, your different layers of uh, kind of UI on top of each other based on camera um, and interactive interactability as well. Um, so layers and camera, uh, really important stuff. Small note is that you can reduce the amount of kind of, uh, of what gets rendered per camera based on your layers. So make sure that when you're setting up your system that if you're going to render only your UI, that you set all your UI elements to a particular layer, or you can call it UI. Um, and then in your camera settings, then make sure that you just are rendering only the UI. Right, static reference objects. Um, so as I said before, reducing singletons, they cause a lot of issues. Um, and so I generally will have two or three different static objects. One is your global static reference. So when everything in your global starts to load up, it says, hey, you know, I'm alive, so it'll be, let's say, global reference dot audio manager, and then I'll you know, assign my reference to that, uh, or data manager. Then that will load up first, and then you load your subscene. So you'll have, let's say I have a, uh, like a menu scene and a, um, and a game scene and maybe a store scene, right? And each one of those, Scenes will have their own um, static reference. It'll be a scene reference. So I can go uh, game reference dot, uh, uh, I don't know, player equals this. Um, and it's a great way for you to reference things. You don't have to like traverse many trees. It becomes a little bit verbose at times, but um, it's kind of stable. Um, a note though with the scene reference stuff is make sure that whenever you unload your scene that you are clearing your um, scene references. So uh, on destroy, which is your unity message command, make sure that you clear all your stuff. Right, data manager. So uh, one of the things that people don't address up front usually in a lot of their games is how they handle data. Um, and you kind of say, well, I'm not an application developer. I don't have to deal with databases. I don't care. Uh, but there's a lot of data in games that we have to store. So um, it's good to uh, create your data methodology up front um, so that people know where stuff is and where to update stuff, right? You can get your intern to go and update the prices on your store because they know exactly where the data object is. Um, make sure that with your data objects, you everything that's, that's a piece of data, right? It's something that's sitting in an array that is you know, just referencing data, prefix with data or something like that so that you know that when you see a class in your Unity structure, if it's prefixed with data, it's a data container. Um, it's serialized and not a mono behavior. Your data manager will be a mono behavior because it has to kind of uh, start up and have an update loop, but um, your actual data classes are serialized and then that allows you to save them out to JSON. Uh, JSON is awesome and I love it and it allows you to quickly bake out data, make updates and upload it if you want to. Um, so the other thing is that in a design consideration with your data manager is that you're going to have dynamic data, data that you want to update. I mean, anybody who's made uh, mobile applications knows that when you submit it to the App Store, you don't want to have to do that again if you just want to change a decimal point somewhere. So you want to allow um, your system also to reference um, data on the server, pull it down. And once again, JSON becomes very handy because it's easily deserializable. Uh, there's a great class called JSONFX. Um, that allows you to kind of quickly serialize and deserialize objects. So if you can, check that out. Um, I've got a custom version of that with a lot of like Unity specific data structures. So hit me up for that if you want as well. 
Um, so I separate data for games into static, dynamic, and player data, and I'll explain that now. Yes. Okay, static data is basic, like stuff that will never change. It describes some of your game. Um, sometimes my static data has been my level information, and uh, depends what type of game you have, if it's just like speed and force and that kind of stuff. And you can break this down and you know make a nice nested tree of all the kind of data you want. Um, it's global reference data, so just, you know, a uh, scene loads up, needs to know what the scene is all about, like a description about it. That stuff gets stored here. Um, so levels, layout, that kind of stuff is good. Next is dynamic data. Dynamic data is uh, that stuff that I told, about, told you about that changes that you want to be able to update, right? So things like pricing for your store system um, and uh, yeah store system stuff, um, but uh, you want to be able to sync it. So once again, JSON comes in handy because you can sync it. Um, and um, you should be looking at when you build this particular part, making sure you use a www object to go and get your data, make sure that it's version control, that you have a version one and that it compares it with the version the other one and replaces it. Uh, did I do this right? No. There we go. Player data. So this is the third type of data that you're going to have in your game. And player data is all the stuff that your player has done. So now this is the holy grail. Don't mess up here. I have before, and it's really horrible. Um, so you generally stay this, save this in your player prefs. Uh, it's unique to your player. So remember that when you make your structure. Um, it's persistent through versions. And this is where people can screw up quite a bit, because you can change your game and the structure of your game. And now the way that it accesses that data is different. So make sure that your data, your game version number is somewhere so stored within your um, player data. So that let's say you push out a new version of your game and you got a lot more data, that you can actually then have a way of changing version one data to version 1.1 player data. Um, yeah, be aware that this can really trip you up when you release a version. So you have a successful game, launch it, a lot of people love it, and you release an update, breaks everything, everybody hates you and you lose all your money. Um, <laughs> uh, what else? Right. So I know that I'm going fast. If anybody has uh, needs me to repeat anything, just throw up your hand and I'll do that. I'll remind you that there'll be questions at the end. So now we get to probably one of the most useful parts, which is the input manager. Um, and so you've got multiple different you know, methods of input. Most of those methods rely on the camera, right? <coughs> I want to click on a button, you want to click on something, it has to go through the camera, find out where the thing actually is, and down. So when you create your input manager, make sure that you create it in reference to the camera, and I'll show you a small, simple structure later. Um, it's good to decouple from UI solutions, because in Unity, things have changed so much and probably will always change, and although one thing might be completely awesome, uh, you will have something else uh, that will come in that you want to use part of. And the only thing that stops you from doing that is really your input, right? So if you have Engu is your sprite rendering system and you have your input manager on top, it doesn't stop you at all from having another sprite system like 2D Toolkit or a text system like Text Mesh Pro, which is awesome, by the way, um, and being able to use those side by side, right? So uh, input manager is really important. Um, the other reason to have your own input manager is to know how to consume your touches or your click events, right? So you're gonna click on a button and you wanna make sure that now that I clicked on that button, it doesn't go through anywhere else or maybe you want that to happen, right? Um, so rolling your own allows you to say, okay, well, um, I can have a little static flag that says nothing got touched. If on input nothing got touched, then I can do a, a pan around the map, for instance. Um, it also allows you to manage your own efficiency. Input uh, responsiveness on mobile devices has been kind of tricky um, a lot with Unity. Uh, so this allows you to have an update loop that's static that you can run like whenever you want. So I found it useful to run it kind of um, on last update and on update or sometimes on GUI as well because a GUI event, an on GUI event, although we hate on GUI, um, that event gets called multiple times and it gets called in relation to your touches. So it's useful to pop it in there sometimes if you're having latency issues. 
Um, it also works well with 3D and 2D, right? You can have 2D selectable stuff and 3D selectable stuff and it all talks the same way because it's all getting interpreted through the camera. Um, and the other thing that I was a little bit disappointed with the Unity guys with their input system was that um, it was kind of based on the rect of the sprite, but there's so many times when you want to have like custom hit areas. Um, and if you base your input system on colliders, you can use poly, uh, Unity's new polygon collider, 2D collider, to be able to like draw custom shapes around the stuff you want to tap. Right? There we go. So this is a very, 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 very simple structure. Um, you've got your manager, which is your input manager. Mine is a static, uh, uh, is a static object, so it's not a mono behavior. And then I invoke the update on my global update loop. Um, so in that update loop, there is a whole bunch of magic that happens. I go through. I take you uh, all the Unity input stuff and check when it's down, when it's up, fuzz that stuff. But then. After I've done that, I go through um, my own like little structure of stuff that I've set up. So if I set up a button, I'll set up a new input touch collider button, right? And that gets registered, that gets attached to a camera stack, whatever camera it's under. Um, and then I go, whenever something happens, I go through my camera stack, loop through all the objects in the camera stack. I just do a ray trace per thing that's actually in the camera stack instead of doing like a physics.raytrace all. Um, and that helps me to control the efficiency of everything if I wanted to. And also, like, I can have colliders that do other things that are not input, and I don't have to worry about them consuming touches. Um, so we'll have a camera stack that will have uh, collider objects underneath it. So that's the general structure, is you iterate through your camera stack, and the camera stack will have objects underneath it. You'll iterate through them and see, okay, cool, like, per this camera, I do my ray trace, I know that I can have orthographic and perspective-based cameras, and they'll handle everything happily. Um, so that's a very general overview of the Input Manager. There's a lot there, so please pull me aside or get my contact details and shoot me a mail, and we can do a Skype, and we can talk about how you want to structure stuff, or maybe I can send you some of mine. Event manager. So for encapsulation, you need to be able to talk to things. Um, and you want to talk to things regardless of if it's your, you know, your first project or your fifth project, you want to use that same component. The other useful thing for having events and ways to access events is that you can now expose a lot of things to game designers, right? You don't have to sit there and link up all their dialogues together, and then they say, no, they changed their mind, they want something else. Then you can just give them like uh, the event manager, let them type in their strings, and they can launch whatever dialogues they want. Um, so make it as simple as possible. The way that I've done it is a switchboard approach where you just have a static class that has kind of a list of, like a dictionary of names of the objects. Uh, so you can have like a string list and then things like an event that they're attached to. So it doesn't matter which one starts up first. So if I want to register an event listener or if I want to say, hey, I'm the guy who's gonna invoke this, I just say, this is the name of my event and if it exists, then add it to the event stack. If it doesn't exist, make the new event and add it to the stack. Um, that way you're not, you know, you're not processing anything on the update loop. You have the owner of the event can then invoke the event by just triggering the name and then everything on the event that you've added to will fire. Um, you can use Unity's new one. I don't know too much about the structure um, whenever it's out, but I'm gathering people at projects now that need to get out, so uh, this might be a good idea. A little about callbacks for the new guys. There's great things in C Sharp called delegates. Use them, please. They're fantastic. Um, there's a system.action, which is a generic delegate that you can then you know, easily inline write some code about. Um, so when I specify events within my event manager, I'm talking specifically about C Sharp events, which is easily uh, set up by event, variable type. I think I did that right. Event, delegate, variable name. So look at that stuff. You can add multiple um, kind of uh, functions per that event and remove them by using the plus equals minus equals. Um, also, make sure that your event naming convention is really, really clear. I use a double underscore. Um, I don't know where they came from, but it's very useful so that you can see what is an event and what is a function name. 
Dialogue Manager. This is my favorite thing because it saves me so much time. So with Dialogues, uh, it's just basically a message to the user. And so many times you kind of, you make a game, you think you're done, uh, but then we need to put like tutorials and specific things. Dialogue Manager comes in really handy because it's just a way of like displaying stuff to the user. It can have very uh, simple interactivity. Um, once again, keep it as simple as possible. And if you want complex stuff to it, then just allow somebody to um, extend that class. Um, what a dialogue basically is, is on a separate uh, camera, so you'll have your game camera or how many game cameras you have, UI camera that will be on top of that, a render lay on top, and then you have your dialogues, which will be a render lay on top of all of that, um, so that you can pop up a, you know, a message saying, are you sure you wanna do this? So a couple of things that are useful with knowing about dialogues is that you have a big collider at the back, right? So you don't let uh, clicks or touches through. Um, I've generally found that if you had a big kind of uh, a black box that you can fade the alpha in and out of, that always comes in handy, so I just built it in. Um, and make sure that your dialogue system stacks on top of each other. I've gone back and forth between different methodologies of like whether I can only get away with you know, one being shown at a time, but stacking is very, very useful because then it allows you to nest dialogues and then when you make a store, uh, it's basically just a set of dialogues that you populate with data. Um, so dialogues aren't complex things. Most of these things I'm just talking about is like, it's a game object with a script on it that's called a dialogue, and you've got a dialogue manager that handles how do we invoke them. Um, make sure that you allow uh, your dialogues, your dialogues will have, sorry, four different animation types. Get used to that now because you don't wanna, you know, get into that later and like, retrofit everything, is that you'll always have a closed, closing, open and opening state. So allow you to make sure that like if something is currently opening, not to open it again. And dialogues, people always want animations and little transition-y things in with them. So I have those states built in the beginning and it uh, kind of helps you a lot. With animating those things, um, you can animate them by code, but please make use of the Unity animation system. It is really, really useful. Um, wow, I am uh, moving a bit slow. Oh. Pick up the pace. Anyway, so uh, so make sure that the animation system is, uh, you use animation system for fading things in and out, um, and you can even scale things in and out, move them in. Uh, right. See, uh, so with dialogues, make sure that you, um, you have multiple approaches. So you can link uh, prefabs directly to them, but if your dialogue system is ever present, know that if you have a linked prefab, that it's gonna always consume the amount of memory that that prefab um, takes up, whether it's visible or not, right? So we're not talking about rendering, we're talking about graphical memory. So it's a good idea to allow you to link things because then they'll load up faster, but it's also a good idea to be able to give a path to resources so that you can load a, a big dialogue up without consuming that amount of memory all the time. Uh, right, a uh, big issue is UI agnosticism. And I like this word because it sounds important, but it is a really important idea. As I said, uh, you know, UI stuff changes all the time. Um, it's good for you to decouple yourself from your particular UI solution, um, and that's why you build an event manager and an input manager. It just allows you to be flexible, right? And it'll allow your code base to you know, happily move from one project to the other. There are things with all the different UI systems that are very useful and handy. Um, 2D Toolkit has this thing called sp uh, sprite dicing, which allows you to use, take big sprites, cut them up, and uh, not duplicate the actual you know, cut up a piece, so you kind of compress your uh, big full screen textures down quite a bit. Uh, Engui is great, uh, Text Mesh Pro again is great as well, and you want to use the best collection of things for you. Um, so try and do that. Uh, guidelines for rolling your own, don't. It's a lot of work, it's a pain in the ass, and you're gonna spend way too much time trying to kind of keep that up, and it's still not gonna be as good as the other stuff. Unless that's your entire business, then go for it. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna move on. Okay, this is important. That's important. That magic number is the magic number that I design all my games for. Um, I've got that because I took a look at all the tablets that were important, put all the sizes down and the aspect ratios, and then got the biggest possible size that I could design for. That number will change in the future, but 
I checked it a couple of days ago, and it still will fit your biggest size. So when you design your assets, design it for that size, and then you can scale down from there. Um, I encourage you guys to set up your own spreadsheet where you put in the different screen resolutions and aspect ratio and figure out what the biggest size is uh, because then you can update it as needed. Um, it also gives you a good idea of like how you're going to use your UI system because you need to understand how this stuff works and then you can make solutions to deal with the multi-resolution rendering. Uh, your screen size, sorry. So it's your maximum screen size. You design to that size when you scale down uh, for like iPad 2, it will just clip off the edges. Um, but be aware that that's the maximum size that you'd have to design for. With designing for multiple sizes, you need a quality manager. And this quality manager will then um, make sure that you, um, what device you're on, uh, you calculate, okay, look, I'm on an iPad 2. I need to have half resolution for all my textures. Um, it allows you to swap out textures yourself. It allows you to swap out assets yourself, depending on what you have. Um, it, you've got this thing called MipMaps MipMap Bias. I have to touch this because it's really important. MipMaps on textures um, are useful because you can size them. Right, so it does this sort of anti-aliasing thing, so if it's too small, it'll switch to a smaller one. Um, in a lot of cases with 2D intensive games, people turn off mip maps uh, and use very specific sizes so it's pixel perfect. That's great, but sometimes when you use resizable images, you don't want that kind of crispy thing that happens when it resizes, so you have to turn on mip maps. But now you don't want the crappy down version that generally appears on your screen. And to sort that out, there's something called mip map bias. Um, it's only accessible through code, uh, and you have to set it at runtime. It basically just says which one of the multiple images in the mip map you're going to use. Um, so a good setting is negative 6.5. Um, it kind of just suggests that it uses the most, the higher res of the two images that it's deciding to use out of the multiple resolution of images that you have. Uh, so remember that. Also remember with mip maps, you still have all the images in your texture, right? So if you have like a 1024, but you wanted to use the, the 512, the 1024 still exists, still in memory. Um, and whenever you're doing your UI stuff, you're going to have three sizes, which is your 4x size, your biggest size, 2x, 1x. Keep that in your consideration. Make sure that when you design your assets, that you're going to resize. With knowing those things, remember that you've got this like uh, divisible by four thing happening. So if you're going to have an image that's 400 pixels, you're gonna, you know, half res is 200, and then uh, the lowest res is 100. And so if you have half pixels, you know what I mean? Like if your, your, your big image that you're resizing, you get down to your smallest one is like 56.5, you're gonna get resy stuff on the side. So try and make sure that all your assets are power of two. Yeah. Uh, let me go back. Yeah, so detecting quality for iOS is really easy. There's this thing called iPhone.generation. It'll tell you what iPhone or iPad generation you have, and then you can kind of switch things accordingly because you know what size they are. Android is another beast completely. Um, I haven't got a fix-all solution, but right now what I do is I take the size of the screen, uh, multiply the width of the pixels by the height of the pixels, get a number, and then I say if the, you know, if the height is above this particular uh, number, then use the 4x um, assets. If it's below, use 2x. It's a good way of judging it. You can get to the memory settings of the device to then try and figure out if what texture size to use, uh, but uh, it hasn't really proven useful for me. I couldn't get it to work properly. Right, so build system, this is not your automated build system, but it is still useful to have. Uh, the problem is you want to ensure that um, when you build your project, that um, it builds the same every time, and then all those little nuances that you want to ensure are there um, when you publish on a different platform are there. So I encourage you to make your own little build window for your editor. Um, really important things are build number and versioning would encourage you to plug into Git or SVN to get the latest 
to count the how many commits have happened. Use that as your last build number. So you have three build numbers, major, minor, and the amount of commits you have. Just helps you to know which version you're using. Um, and so when you're testing, like nobody reports an ill bug, um, gets really useful for this because you can use tags to kind of specify uh, or save the data for you know what your, your, your primary and secondary version number is. Um, this also allows you to then set specific settings. So if you have your own build window and then you say, hey, set settings, um, you can make sure that it sets the right bundle ID, the right product name, um, and when you switch between multiple Android platforms, that becomes useful. When you, because Amazon is an Android platform, you know, Google Play kind of is an uh, Android platform, you can use that to identify, say, variables in your code about what platform you're on. Editor utils, please use them, get to know your editor. It's really, really useful. Um, you can build really simple things like clearing player, player prefs. Um, it sounds stupid, but it's one of the most useful editor settings that I have. Um, allows you to make sure that you start from zero when you're testing a new game. Snapping, snapping is incredibly useful and it's very easy to do in the editor. If you have problems with this, please shoot me a mail and I will send you some very, very easy code. Um, so two editor tools areas that I find is useful is um, textures. So you can write your own um, texture resizing so you don't have to do that manually. That is totally possible within the editor. Um, and then texture profiles. You know, you import a texture, it's automatically compressed and set to something. You can get in there and then select a whole bunch of textures and set it to like 32-bit readable if you want to. Um, mesh tools. Mesh tools I have found the most interesting, allows you to bake things. You can bake meshes in Unity really, really easy because Unity has a function called mesh.bake, I think. Um, so you can just give it a bunch of meshes and it'll spit out a mesh for you. Um, the other thing with mobile games is you've got, when you have things like a circle, um, Unity's more poly friendly than it is alpha and texture friendly. So if you can just make a little editor tool that will spit you out a circle and you can slap um, a texture on that, that'll save your clipping and your overdraw for uh, your textures. Um, and also allow you just to make basic shape shapes at a very kind of low cost to your rendering and just overlay them, have fun. Uh, vertex colors and uh, UVs are really useful. I found them a lot. Let's say you just want a gradient for a background. You don't want to import a gradient texture. You don't want to write a shader to do it. You can just make a quad. Set the vertex colors at the top and bottom and there you go, right? You don't even need a texture. Uh, there's a lot of different issues where you want to bake in data into your vertexes so that you can access that on the shader specifically for batching. So it's very useful to expose that stuff in the editor and bugger around with it. Uh, packaging your framework. Uh, Gonna rush through this, so just make sure you've got your framework in a separate folder so that you can mid it and um, can you know kind of move it from project to project and stay away from DLLs. They seem really cool, but they don't really support minor behavior unless you include the binary inside. And I kind of the biggest problem is when you update your DLL, all your GUID information that references your objects are stuck inside there and Unity doesn't get to it. So you make a new DLL, all of a sudden it makes new GUIDs and you get that missing mono behavior problem. So kind of stay away from DLLs. You can wrap up stuff that is not mono behavior driven uh, in DLLs that might help you to control your source a little bit more, but uh, try to stay away from them. And lastly, little pro tips. Um, comment your code, I know it's stupid. Uh, nobody does this, but they should do this because you don't code for yourself, you code for your team, right? So you aren't writing code because you know that you'll get back to this, you know exactly what you've done. Somebody else is going to pick that up, either when you leave the company or you get to a better position, somebody's gonna have to read your code and use it. Even you will come back to your code and not understand what you've done. Uh, so make sure that you, uh, you comment your code. Um, use the layer system for layouts. Um, you can kind of hide and um, disable interactivity in the scene view in your editor by using um, the layers. So you just select your layers, make a little layout layer, um, and then make sure that it doesn't render in the game. And then you can like lock it so that you can't touch it. So if you've got a layout PSD, load it in the background, put it on that layer, and then you won't worry about clicking it or anything, and you can lay stuff out on top. Uh, learn shaders. 
Shaders are incredibly useful, specifically on mobile. I know it's a very scary thing, but just go through some of the tutorials. Please do that. And uh, if you're using Mono Behavior on a Mac, the new Mono develop sucks a lot because it doesn't preserve your folding. So you can easily go and use the previous one from I think 4.2 um, that I use often. And the core framework will be coming out soon because you all came, you get a free copy um, when it comes out. But I can only ensure that because they're videotaping this that uh, you guys come up and give me a business card and as soon as it comes out, I will uh, send you a link. And beta testers are welcome, so if you want to take the code base now, bugger around with it, I'll sign a little piece of paper and you can have it. And not that one yet. Uh, finally, questions. Sorry, it's been a bit of a rush, but I think I got there. Right. So early on you talked about source control and you mentioned Git, um, but what do you do for your digital assets? Like, you know, you have like seven gig of like, you know, FBI and tips and stuff. You don't want to put those in Git, right? Um, I do. Um, I, I haven't had too much of a problem every now and again when you have to pull down a, a full project, like that'll become an issue. Um, but then also I work a lot on mobile games. Um, but try and commit everything if you can. Git doesn't have an upper limit of how much stuff, while well, GitHub doesn't. Um, it just gets a little bit slower. Um, and I know people have been afraid of Git because they thought that there was this upper limit, but seven gigs, it's not big, you know, in comparison to some of the other projects. So I would suggest trying that. Yes, sir? Have you ever considered using dependency injection to get around Singleton? Um, I have. I kind of just picked the easiest solution that I worked with. I find that uh, I have to use it and, um, and other people kind of who might not have the same knowledge base as I do have to use it. So the, the, the methodology that I've gone for is as simple as I could. Okay. Uh, earlier you mentioned using layout scenes and prefabs and everybody has their own scenes to avoid stomping each other. Yep. Can you tell me a little more detail about that? Sure. So um, a layout scene, you have a very simple script. Let me see if I can find one for you. Can you guys see that? Yeah. So it's a very simple script um, where um, you make a uh, root game object, pop the script on there. It has a scene to load, which will be a reference to one of the, the main game scenes where this asset can be shown. And then all they do is make their, their, um, their artwork or their game object within this scene in a prefab that is then referenced in another scene, right? So they can work in the scene. It has no reference uh, to the other scene besides the prefab that they're working on. Doesn't affect anything. And then when they press play, using simple code like this, it will destroy everything in that scene, go and load the main scene, and then they can see it work. Does that answer your question? So they're modifying prefabs that are also in the other scene? Correct. Or the, the scene itself is a sub-scene of the scene of the main game scene where you load in the other sub-scenes. Yes, sir? Um, yeah, you talked about um, C-sharp events and then having your own event manager. Do you, do you have any kind of thoughts on when to use the C-sharp event versus your own kind of dictionary of delegates? Um, yes. So um, if you're just a single coder and you're working on self stuff, then I would suggest just doing your own events. But if you're distributing to a team, um, then if you had a dictionary of events, then you can write, uh, let's say, a dialogue, and then extend that dialogue to say that once this thing is opened, then fire this event. And then the game uh, designer can type in the string of the event that they've defined, and then fire another dialogue, for instance. So those are the two things. If you're extending it out for other people um, that are not coders specifically, then use your dictionary of events. If you're just the only coder and it's a small team and you're all used to launching events, then you can keep it you know, in-house. Um, 
I, I don't actually do too much uh, detection stuff. I mean, like in the code, I will use compiler directives of if you're iPhone or not, uh, whether you're using the editor or the actual device. I mean, if I'm in iPhone, then the editor responds very much like the iPhone, so I haven't had too much issue. Um, but if there's like specific things, then I'll just use compiler directives, like the if, you know, Unity iPhone. Um, and I don't have to do too much of that. I haven't found too many issues. Yes, sir. Using your event manager, how do you avoid the sort of classic problems with events being that they're difficult to debug um, because you end up with a long chain of things that you can't follow? Um, well, with the event manager, I mean, like if you have an error somewhere in the chain, uh, it is it is harder to debug. But um, if they are chained on, usually they will be kind of nested within the, the anonymous uh, functions and you can track them. But generally, unless, like I said, you're working with game designers and stuff that you need to, I will stay away from that. But and then my other question was, uh, you mentioned using a proxy to clear callbacks to your web stage nesting. How does that work exactly? Um, it just means that like, a, a lot of time you end up chaining events uh, or yeah, chaining these callbacks. Uh, just make sure that in the function where you know, you're going to call a function that says um, play animation, and at the end of the animation is going to call the callback, that maybe you want to call the same function again. So make sure that you have like um, new uh, delegate name, assign the, the callback that you actually were invoking, like the name, to that proxy, clear the one, the, the callback that was supposed to be called, and then invoke that proxy. And then make sure that you can always chain stuff and it never kind of overwrites. Right at the back. Yes, sir. Yes. The player press are hidden. <laughs> well. Um. Well, I mean, I, I generally will save a JSON structure to the player prefs, pull it back out. So if there's any issue with the data, the data that I get, that I'll get an error with either my JSON fuzzing um, or when I invoke that. And that's the only way that I debug that. I won't save lots of little things to the player prefs. I'll just save this one JSON data document back and forth. And that helps me ensure that there's integrity. Right, right at the back, yeah. Yes. That's in Unity Pro. What about users? What about teams, small teams that want to collaborate that don't have Unity Pro? And does your framework that you mentioned take that into account? If you're a programmer, generally not. If you're a, um, if you're an artist, uh, you can um, you can use the the layout scene loading. Um, to test your, your stuff, but you can also design it without doing the multi-scene stuff. You can, instead of loading multiple parts in your main scene, you can then just um, reference prefabs that people are working on. Uh, but I would highly recommend getting Pro if you can. All right, I think that's it. Um, and I'm gonna put up interesting stuff here that is important for you because it's my information. Uh, so that's my email address, roger at collectivemass.com. It's my Twitter handler. Uh, I have a blog up where I do uh, podcasts with other developers and try and get all those little things that they tripped up on in the beginning to help share information with you. Uh, so check that out on iTunes or on the blog. And make sure to drop your business card off. Uh, big thanks to um, Amorce Inc. for uh, letting me do this talk. I'm on their budget right now. Um, and check out Notespace um, Beat when it comes out on iOS. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, I will spam you with those. Thank you.